Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today at the Ashoka Get Wiser Summit, specifically our panel here. Um, and the conversation today will be around really changing the narrative around philanthropy and the role that women have been playing most recently, especially in the, the most recent years. And I'm so delighted to be here um, today with you all. So thank you very much for joining us. I'm sure as the conversation progresses, you will be just as excited as I am um, to be in the midst of some of our esteemed um, panelists today, which I'll, who I'll be introducing very, very shortly. But we are so glad to have you today engaged in what we are really calling um, less of a panel and more of a conversation. Because we know as individuals, each of us has best practices, we have learned lessons, we have deep insights, and we look forward to sharing and learning from you all um, today in regards to that. So thank you so much for joining. With that, I would like to quickly um, introduce our panelists. Um, and to do that, uh, I will have just a quick presentation that I would like to, to use to be able to introduce them. On our panel today um, is, is Lisa Greer, and Lisa is a philanthropist, a nonprofit advisor, and convener. She's also the author of the best selling book, Philanthropy Revolution, which we'll have an opportunity to share some insight on a little bit later. And over the last 10 years, um, Lisa has, has lived in Beverly Hills. She's made that her home. And she's connected with several nonprofits and donors in that community there. In 2021, she served as the commissioner of the California State CSW, which is the Commission on the Status of Woman. She sits on the board of the New Israel Fund and she serves on the executive committee of the Cedar Sinai's Board of Governors. She has also served as commissioner and chair of the Beverly Hills Cultural Heritage Commission and the trustee of the Jewish Community Foundation of Los Angeles. And she's a board member of many, many organizations, including the LA District Attorney's Crime Prevention Foundation, Make-A-Wish of Greater Los Angeles, as well as the Girl Scouts of Greater Los Angeles and others. Also in conversation with us today is our second panelist, Masu Layodi. And Masu is a development professional. She has over 20 years of experience really in the international development and the nonprofit leadership space. She currently serves as the executive director of the African Philanthropy Forum, where she works extensively across Africa with established and emerging philanthropists who are committed to the sustainable and emerging um, inclusive development of Africa. She has been very instrumental on the continent as one of um, the founding members um, in the establishment of APF um, as an independent entity in Africa. Prior to this, she served as the executive director of Women in Business and Leap Africa, leading, which is a, both our leading nonprofit organizations, specifically in Nigeria. She's passionate about the interplay of social issues and business. She also founded Social Runway, which is also a nonprofit organization that supports social innovators. Also serving on our panel today um, is Rosa Madeira. And Rosa is the mother of three children. She's a social entrepreneur. She's an ecosystem builder, a speaker, and she's the founder of Empathy, which is a social and environmental organization that works in venture philanthropy and social investment. She also serves as the responsible leader with the BMW Foundation. And Rosa is on the board of several nonprofit organizations. Over the last 20 years, over the last 20 years, she's held several global management positions across different industries that reflect strong social commitment. She holds a master in European law from Saarbrücken and a master in public administration from the University of Compostens. She has um, specialized in several nonprofit courses such as, such as managing impact, venture philanthropy, governance and giving circles and gender as well. So we are so um, grateful to have our panelists and their contribution of talent and time. 
I'll just introduce myself as moderator very briefly as well. I, um, I'm a leadership group member here at Ashoka, uh, which of course we know is uh, one of the world's greatest networks of social entrepreneurs in, in the world. Um, I founded an organization almost 20 years ago myself and became an Ashoka Fellow nine years ago. Uh, my background is primarily in the education technology space. However, here at Ashoka, I have the privilege of leading a team here called the Strategic Entrepreneurship Relationships Team, which really connects high impact, high net worth, entrepreneurs to social entrepreneurs, because fundamentally we believe that what makes entrepreneurs angry and keeps them up at night also makes social entrepreneurs angry and keeps them up at night. And so we connect both high impact entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs to sit around the table and start having conversations in regards to some of these big global issues, how we can solve those issues collaboratively um, acknowledging the fact that everyone, and indeed everyone, has an opportunity to be a change maker. And so I'm really, really honored to be here today with our esteemed panelists to have a conversation around, um, around women and, and philanthropy and the role that we play in this environment today. And so leading off to that, you know, we there's really no question, absolutely no question. That, um, that anyone's personal wealth is a product of really collective effort. And this collective effort is a combination of different social structures which provide opportunities um, to some people and obstacles to countless others. Over the last couple of years, particularly um, with the advent of COVID and now post COVID, we've been seeing some changes in, in the market, in the philanthropy market. First of all, with more female entrepreneurs now emerging, more intergenerational wealth, for instance, those transfers going on to daughters rather than just sons. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, even as much as 10% of ultra high net worth individuals globally are women. And so the world of philanthropy is changing and it's changing in many, many ways. I'd like to open the panel up, um, just, we can start with Lisa, just to share some, some examples of how she's seen really this world of philanthropy changing, um, especially more recently with the advent of um, female philanthropists. Thank you, Lisa. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here and uh, hello to all the participants. Uh, so I have been doing uh, philanthropy and working with uh, different organizations as well as advising uh, for about about a decade um, and I have personally gone through uh, a number of different changes which um, ha happily are starting to change for the better but um, starting off when I made we made our first major gift about 10 years ago uh, and when I called the organization to tell them that I was going to give them an unsolicited gift to close their capital campaign where they were restoring a building uh, I, um, I was told first, um, I don't know what to say. The person said, I don't know what to say because I didn't make an ask. And I thought, why can't I just give money without, you know, unsolicited? I don't understand. And then after that, um, the person hung up the phone and then called my husband and asked him if he knew what I was doing. Uh, at the time I was actually the head of this organization and, um, and yet they had no qualms about saying, let's, uh, uh, let's let's call your husband. My husband was uh, couldn't believe it actually, and um, I uh, really took that to to kind of be aware of this strange world that I was in because I, I it, it, people think that you know I, I think the general work world ha definitely has issues related to women, but with philanthropy it's it's about I don't know 10, 20, 30 years behind. So um, I uh, uh, was very pleased um, as were as were a whole bunch of organizations to see that um, with Mackenzie Scott's, uh, the way that she gave, and those were all unsolicited gifts. And it was, um, she just sort of, you know, plowed through it and she has the means to be able to do that and to make a very large difference. Um, so the fact that they were unrestricted gifts, that they were unsolicited, um, and that her big thing is she says they were given with full trust and no strings attached, which is a really big deal. 
Uh, from that, I feel like it's given license to other women. Well, it's, it, I think it's woke, it, it, it woke up a lot of the men and, and general public uh, about giving, but I think it also um, kind of paved a way extremely quickly uh, for women, because she's only been giving for, I think, three or four years, uh, for women to be treated a little bit differently. And, and in fact, when Mackenzie Scott gave her first round of gifts, uh, she was um, really attacked in the uh, philanthropy press. A lot of people were saying, how could she do that? She didn't prep. She didn't have 1,500 people helping her. And they've kind of gotten over it. Each time she gives more money, there's less um, uh, pushback, which is really great. Uh, so I am um, uh, very excited about what's happening. And one of the things that uh, I, I just love, one quick story is at Dartmouth, and you can all look this up online, uh, a number of women got together and said, you know, people, even even for the alumni, the, uh, the, the fundraisers at the institution are always calling our husbands. Even if they didn't go to the same school, they're calling our husbands or, or, or sending email to our husbands. And one woman got upset about this a few years ago, and she started a giving, kind of a giving circle type thing, a women's program, which has uh, today, uh, just recently in the last um, few months, they have had 104 Dartmouth alum give a million dollars each for a total of $386 million plus $60 million in legacy giving. And that is something that I just don't, I, I didn't see coming and I don't think that would have happened a few years ago. And I think it's really, really exciting. So bodes well for the sector and for women. You're, you're absolutely right, Lisa. And, um, you know, really over the last two years, just like you've said, we've almost seen kind of a, a paradox in giving, right? Um, so we have Mackenzie Scott, we have Melinda French um, Gates, really citing that they are focusing less on data and metrics and more on the leadership and the proximity to the problem, right? And so that is slightly a bit of a change of what we've seen philanthropy to be over, over the years. And so um, just the ability to kind of shift the mindset, it's, it's relatively new, but we certainly are optimistic that, um, you know, that is where the sector is leaning towards. Um, we'd love to hear from you, Masu, from your, your experience um, on the ground as well, what your thoughts are in terms of the changing sector. Thank you, Angie Deck, and um, great to be here. Lisa, thank you for opening the conversation with such um, powerful examples of what's going on around in our world. Um, so I'll speak from the African context, um, which is, you know, in a way different from what's happening in the rest of the world, but also to say that the whole world is looking at what, and African women are also inspired by what's going on, especially by McKinsey Scott. Um, and I would, you know, maybe just backtrack a little and share a little bit about African philanthropy forum. So we were established at, by the Global Philanthropy Forum in San Francisco, not in Africa, in 2014. But we became an independent entity in 2017, registered in Nigeria and in South Africa with footprints in 14 countries and just working with philanthropists and social investors um, and, and taking them through the process of becoming more strategic in the way they give. So I tell everyone I get the opportunity to, and especially when I'm speaking with an international audience, and by international, I mean non-African, um, that giving is not new to us on the African continent. What is new is the concept of of organized philanthropy. So that's what APF was set up to do, to get philanthropy more organized. And there is an increasing number of high net worth individuals on the African continent because of the increasing wealth, economic growth on the continent. We have um, the high net worth individuals have a collective wealth and potential giving capacity of up to $7 billion annually. And a lot of these are women. Um, and what is interesting in, in Africa is that a lot of the first generation wealth holders in Africa are men and they are entre you know, the entrepreneurs that made money um, and got involved in philanthropy. But now we're seeing that there is a wealth transfer as Njideka mentioned to girls. Um, we also see that a lot of the women that are you know, possibly wives or partners of of the philanthropists are leading their foundations, not because they have nothing else to do, 
it's really because they are better at making these decisions and they're more philanthropic um, than men. So that is pretty interesting to note um, that men, are, women are more philanthropic and they are very detailed in, in their decision-making process and they are very particular about who to fund. And why this is interesting at this time is that where the, the world is talking more about unrestricted giving, long-term giving, um, and really looking at funding proximate leaders. I think these were some of the issues that Lisa touched on at the beginning of her, of, of her presentation or her speech. Now, um, a lot of the giving in Africa we have seen um, has, has happened through intermediaries. Um, Africa Philanthropy Forum and Bridgespan last year carried out a research project that showed that only 9% of large gifts by African donors are going to local organizations and 14% by international donors going to local nonprofit organizations. So let the rest go through government and international NGOs. So a lot of local nonprofits and proximate leaders and organizations lack the funding that they need to shift systems and make a difference in their local communities. And so you see that you know, women being at the forefront of philanthropic activity and decision-making in family foundations and private foundations are making the center stage. Uh, particularly those that are working in the Africa Philanthropy Network, because they are philanthropists that have been in the space for over 20 years. Um, they established philanthropists. They have a good understanding of what is happening in the space. So they're really shifting their focus to supporting proximate organizations, given maybe at this stage in Africa, not um, unrestricted, but at least long-term repeated um, grants are being made. And I think we're on the journey to get into unrestricted, um, long-term, no strings attached type uh, funding. Um, and so what I see in, in, in the African context is a move towards a um, supporting proximate organizations um, and also supporting a lot of initiatives that are not just African led, but led by African women and African women that are working with women and girls. It is clear, the statistics make it clear that to develop any economy, we need to develop women and girls. And Africa is one of the continents that is really behind when we talk about the um, education and economic empowerment of women and girls. So we need to close that gender gap. And that's where women come in. And I'll close by saying that we just partnered with Co-Impact, which I'm sure everyone that works with women really is familiar with. We just partnered with Co-Impact on the Gender Fund, which is, um, uh, a fund that is dedicated to women in the global south. Um, and so we are the Africa partner and it's the, the initiative is being led by my board chair, Siti Masi, who are the um, co-chair, sorry, co-founder and executive chair of Higher Life Foundation. And what we're aiming to do over the next 10 years is to raise $50 million on the African continent to support women get women and girls and proximate organizations on the African continent. So we're really excited about that um, and excited about what the future holds um, for women and girls on the African continent. Thank you, Mosu. You mentioned several things, one of which is collective action, which we'll talk on or touch on a little bit later. But also when you think about, you know, the rise of more wealthy, female philanthropists, for instance, this means that more money is being directed towards causes that may previously have been marginalized or even underfunded, right? One of which is, is gender equality and, um, and sustainable development. So a lot of that, a lot of the focus is even more so on these areas, a more diverse representative range of voices are starting to influence decision-making. And it's it's um, you know high net worth female donors that are really amongst the key drivers in this sector. So we look forward to seeing a lot more of that. So Rosa, what are your thoughts as we think about philanthropy <laughs> in the future? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. And after listening to Lisa and Morsu, I think they said everything already. But yeah. well, I will try to, to say my my opinion too. I'm I'm very happy to be here and I, I'm listening about the nonprofit sector in the States, the nonprofit sector in Africa. And I think 
in Latin America is also an Ibero-America. I speak always about uh, Ibero-America, Latin America with Spain, because I'm from Spain living in Chile since almost uh, uh, 20, 15 years working in the nonprofit sector. And as Lisa said, I'm seeing many things changing after COVID. Philanthropy before COVID and philanthropy after COVID. For, for me, that is a new change in many things. And I think women in this uh, in this uh, sector is also changing philanthropy. I mean, I know to be, because the studies about the Indiana University, you know, because McKinsey that is changing because I see it. I see it in all the movements and I see it in the contest, in the terrain, and see how the, the, the women are more um, uh, working with this diversity and to democratize in the philanthropy. They want to do that. Like as women, we want to work more bottom up. We like to work bottom bottom up. We don't like these things about okay, the people that has uh, uh, the money, the music. We like to hear and listen active uh, hearing. We like to be there in the contest. We like to see who is in the nonprofit sector, who is the executive director. We are more. Um, I don't know if we are more or not. I don't want to be bad with the men, but I think we, we like to be active, engaged. We like to be active, engaged, and to and, and to know what is happening behind. I'm all the time working in, in, in empathy, I always telling everybody about the peace. No, I'm like the Americans not, not likes to, to see the things with some letters. I'm learning a lot in, in the nonprofit sector also in the States. I'm all the time telling that we like transparency, we like uh, trust, we like trustability, we like um, uh, tangibility. So as we like that, this, this, this piece, we like to be more uh, active, engaged, no? So I think women really, we are like um, active advocating for recognition. Um, for us, the women reasons are very important, very important. And I see also, we can speak later about some, some examples, but women issues such as reproductive health or the workplaces for us is very important. So we are uh, impulsing this kind of sector, this kind of movement, social justice. And I think systematic change, system change is very important for us. We, we don't like these things. I think before, at least in Latin America, always you say, no, I'm working with early childhood causes. I'm working uh, for environment. No, I'm working just for uh, active aging. I working for... We like to work like in this systematic more approach. You can work with elderly, but you can think also about women and you can think also about climate change. I think women, we are more, we know our our minds work different than men. It's, it's, it's all the studies say, and it's right now, I, I have two, two boys and one girl, and I see in my day, day to day, how they work, how they think, how they act. So in the philanthropy, it's the same. It's the same. It's, it's just you see how we act and the systematic approach of all the problems and of the the, 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 the solutions. We have it in our face, in our in our uh, head. It's like uh, very normal to think, mm, how do we get this approach? So yeah, gender equality right now with the uh, ODSs, you know, sustainable goals, also is very important in all the approaches. You no. Know? in the board, in the enterprises, so in philanthropy, of course. I think we need women's philanthropy to, to bring women to the table, to the issues, to, to, the, to, the, to the boards, to the uh, women's equality. Philanthropy is very important, not only because we know that all the studies say that uh, funds for women and girls are uh, underrepresented, that we know that for the studies, but also because I think we are great to do these changes that the, the, the world right now need. And I think with the COVID, all the people are thinking, oh my God, what is happening in, in, in this world? Uh, since many years with hunger, since many years with inequality, since many years with so many problems that we don't we know since I was four and I'm 51, I'm still speaking about the same. <laughs> so with, I think that we, we have a big emphasis about women looking with this emphasis to, to work greater, better with the communities, um, from better bottom up, more systematic. We like to collaborate more, I think. We like to work together. The, the women, we are more social. So this all this movement, this collective impact, this movement to work more articulate, 
it's very it's very attached to our personality too. No, all these uh, associations that are happening, these woman fans, this collective giving, this uh, collective impact. All about collective. We are great about collective. We are very fast in articulating and networking. So uh, in Latin America, in Chile, that I'm right now in Chile, but always looking in a very very American way. Uh, the, the things was a little bit in silos and the nonprofit sector is not so developed like in the States. It's, it's an industry right now is still in, uh, getting much better and also in an ecosystem that is very vibrant. We have B Corps, we have impact investment, we have the uh, sustainability. So also the, the, the sector and the, and the investors and the, the philanthropy is like, oh, I want to be a foundation, I want to be a B Corp. Uh, this is impact investment or is venture philanthropy? Uh, oh, we have to, to so there's so, a, a vibrant ecosystem that we have always to, to relevance the importance of philanthropy, a good philanthropy, because philanthropy is always going to be there. The next gen said, no, Rosa, no, I don't want, no, no, philanthropy is not any, only impact investment, no, please. Impact investment, yeah, okay. With the with all the re, uh, impact uh, financial returns, okay, but social impact we will be need always. So for me, I think we are in a in a moment that female the role of female in social investment in philanthropy is not only important but necessary. <laughs> great, thank you. Thanks. Um, you you really hit on uh, quite a few points, Rosa, and great. Um, transition to our next topic because you touched on several things one including collective action and and the other which is um you know trust-based philanthropy which lisa also spoke about you know in lisa's introduction I, I remember she talked about you know calling to make a donation and kind of being queried and you know then her husband was called shortly after and you know like there's bias all around, but even in the philanthropy sector, there's still there's still that bias. So when I think about collective action and, and kind of trust-based transparency, I'd really love to get your views as panelists, particularly around, um, you know, many female philanthropists, we, we embrace working collaboratively, just like you said, um, Rosa. And so this is increasing the prominence of um, spaces like giving circles and, and um, Lisa mentioned giving circles as well. And, you know, some of them exist in the U.S., like Women Moving Millions or Maverick Collectives or what have you. So there's strength in that, those circles. And perhaps they give us an added advantage of ways to really squash the bias and um, talk about those elephants in the room. We also know that, you know, many donors are, are becoming increasingly uncomfortable um, supporting initiatives and or organizations whose leadership teams and or policymaking structures don't adequately support the groups that they are trying to help, right? And so we see this in female-led organizations as well, and that women tend to channel their resources towards organizations that have several whether it's female or BIPOC, um, you know, representation if they're if they're dealing with gender and minority issues. But would love to hear your thoughts. And we'll start with with um, Lisa again. Would love to hear your thoughts around this premise of collective action and trust based um, transparency in the sector and what we're doing to ensure that we move that along. Sure. Thank you. So. The, the trust is, I think, the big word. I think that is what we have a problem with is that uh, I, I think that the sort of the, the powers that be that for the last hundred and something years, um, I don't think they see women as uh, as as trustworthy relative to money. And I, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but I think that's really what what is stuck in certainly older people's minds. And uh, and that becomes a big problem. So. Consequently, we've had organizations and foundations that have given one-year gifts to to nonprofits, which is ridiculous. And then we have this, uh, um, uh, you know, issue where where they just you know they they work for six months and then have to apply for the next grant and and then take five percent out of the money that is given to be able to just create the metrics to give the person so that they can get another one-year grant. Um, it's, it's all called the starvation cycle, and I think everyone's a little bit familiar with it, but. But that's just crazy. And I feel like um, COVID kind of between COVID and Mackenzie Scott, 
it kind of gave us this moment of change that, uh, and, and I think, you know, and, and everybody's lives being kind of, you know, kind of turned, uh, turned upside down, gave us this moment that was like, okay to change. And um, so, so I see a lot of that coming now where I don't know five years ago if this could have all happened, maybe, but, but it's gotten people used to the idea of we have to change, we have to look at things differently. So I'm, um, I, I think that everything that's happening has been wonderful. I think that this trust piece is, uh, I think women um, seem, I mean, you know, men do too, but I think women are, um, I think maybe by nature, a little more trust, tr trusting. And, um, you know, some people might call that naive. So maybe it's a combination of both. But, but we, you know, I, I, I think, I feel like somehow, maybe because we haven't been part of the party as long, but we're able to look at these organizations and say, you can't give a nonprofit that's getting going, giving, you know, ask them for all sorts of information, make them pull together, you know, have multiple meetings. I, I, I knew one uh, sort of small giving circle and they were having six to eight meetings to give somebody like a $2,500 grant. That's just like not okay. And then, and then saying to them, oh yes, do your thing, but we're only gonna give you a year at a time because we're really not sure. And, and that is, uh, not only is it not productive, I think it's destructive to these organizations, which, which then go out of business and then you create a new version a few years later. And I just think all of that is, is going away or is on the way to going away. And those few organizations that are saying, for example, there was one during COVID that said, a big foundation that said to uh, a colleague of mine, but we will not, nor will we ever accept uh, uh, applications for uh, grants via email. They would not do that. So I think we are that we, we kind of realize that maybe because we're coming from the outside a little bit, how ludicrous that is. And the, you know, the answer to that, though, was not for people to say, OK, fine, we're going to do what you asked us to do. Instead, people are now saying to that foundation, we don't need you. We, we can find other places. And I think that's a great um, a great move towards kind of sanity. And I think women are driving that. Great. That's that's absolutely um, very, very interesting, because, again, you know, we make certain assumptions and we have certain you know, organizations, um, funding organizations have certain biases that exist, even, you know, submit all applications in English. Right. Even that is a bias in itself. And so our ability to identify those biases, decouple those biases and and um, be be you know able to confidently verbalize them, I think, is one area of strength many um, women philanthropists hold as well. Um, and so Mawson would love to hear from your experience also in regards to, you know, trust-based relationship, like, like uh, Lisa talked about a little bit, and then collective action also from your experience. Yeah, I, I think Lisa has really touched on a, a lot of issues, and I would want to pick up from, you know, on one of them because you talked about you know, women being more trusting and maybe that may be perceived as naive. And I, I actually think that makes us open to taking risks. And, you know, this, you, you have to take risks in this space. You can't be on the safe side. If we're going to transform the world, if we're going to make a difference, we have to bet on the people that we know are approximate to the issues. They have been, they have been working in these communities. They have the trust of the communities. It's easier for them to get work done. So a lot of the philanthropists and foundations on, on the African continent are actually operating foundations, not grant makers. And that is one of the practices that we're looking to change at that. At, at African philanthropy firm, you know, to not for philanthropists not to reinvent the wheel and just trust the system and trust the local communities and the NGOs that have been there for decades, but are unable to scale because they just lack the funding and resources and support that can be easily transferred to them and by the philanthropic community. So I think that's where women come in, you know, because we, we have the you know ability to you know, just go behind the figures, go beyond the figures and really see what exactly is happening. And there, there, there is that. And also with, with um, regard to collective action, um, you know, one of, the, one, one of the perceptions in, in my own environment, I don't know if that's the same in the North, is that women don't help each other. Um, you know, it's largely believed that, you know, women like 
that title of the only woman on the board or the only woman philanthropist to do this or the other. So they want to retain that and they don't want to bring others along but that isn't happening in the philanthropic community we're seeing women come together because one individual one organization one foundation cannot change the system we need to work collaboratively and we see that happening during emergencies we saw that during ebola we saw that during the pandemic during the pandemic africans nearly tripled their giving you know so we have to take advantage of you know that momentum we can go back to sleep and wait, wait for another pandemic to wake us up you know we really have to leverage that collective action um, and build a critical mass of givers on the continent and that's why uh, we, we have this we're very much interested in this gender fund which i talked about at the beginning and it's really you know women have to take we have to take the lead on our own development we have to you know take leadership when it comes to bringing women out of poverty, empowering women, so they can have, they can stop being invisible and they can have their place at the table. And we can only do that by putting our money on the table. Yes, we welcome the money from the men, uh, but for this point, we're really going to the women and we're seeing progress um, in, in this drive. And we're really excited about it. I mean, that is not, the Africa Philanthropy Forum is not, uh, we're not, uh, a gender-based organization. This is a project that is really targeted at women. And it's amazing the, the momentum that we're gaining. And I actually think it has a, it, it's really going to be transformative um, what is going to come out of this. And a lot more, it will have a spiral effect beyond the gender fund. And so I'm um, excited about that. And I think it would prove that, you know, um, it will prove those that don't think women can work together wrong because women really can work, have been working together. I always say that I'm a product of strong women. Women have lifted me every stage of my life from infancy into professional life. So I have nothing but praise for powerful women. Um, they, 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 and they work together. I, I ran Wimby's. It was, it was set up by 13 women and one man, and it is a 20 year old organization. So that just shows the power of collective action when women come together and the same goes for philanthropy. Thank you. Thanks, Mosu. You know, when I think about collective action and trust-based transparency, they're almost um, intricately kind of defined in the sense that I think of three things that have to exist for collective action to be successful and also trust-based transparency. And those three things are really kind of the, the mutual learning and respect that goes along with it, the transparency, and then the relationship building, all tenants um, that, that women possess and possess very strongly and, and powerfully um, women across different realms of, of leadership. And so glad to hear that um, that that is kind of a novice that African Philanthropy Forum is leaning, leaning on and leading the way on as well. And um, in, in that same vein, Rosa, we'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Yes, thank you. I think for me, it's interesting to speak a little bit more about giving circles because in Latin America, it's just uh, recently developed. I'm, I'm doing trainings. I lead, I'm learning a lot with Sarah Lomelin from Philanthropy Together, and I'm doing some trainings to different uh, groups. And what I see is when I spoke before about democratizing the philanthropy, I see giving circles for Latin America, they are important because that, because there are people still that they think the voluntary and to be um, yeah, more engaged in their own profit sector, I, I repeat that it's more, um, more in, in the States. Here, the people still think that you have to have a, a, a lot of wealth to be philanthropy. It's not like they think, oh, I can be philanthropy with my talent, with my time, with my ties, with other things of doing things. So giving circles, I'm liking what is happening. We are still uh, doing like pilot. But I see the people say, oh, my God, I'm learning about different issues that I didn't know that was happening in these low income areas or this, in these movements. Uh, I, we are together, learning together. Uh, I can give some sums that it's not like I have to give all my salary <laughs> each month. I, perhaps with $200 or $100 each month, it's OK and we can do changes. So I like to, 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 to show that you can be a philanthropist in different ways. And I think it's a movement also very, very linked to women. 
because as, as we said, we like to be together, we like to celebrate, we like to learn, we like to listen, acting what is happening in these uh, uh, places or in these areas that you didn't know that was happening. Uh, Latin America, you know that all, all, all the countries, there are difference between each country, but we live uh, sometimes in ghettos, no? The, the, the people uh, that we have more professional lives and with more better incomes in a place and the low income areas you don't see if you don't go. So when you see what is happening, uh, this, uh, and, you, and you see this, uh, and you listen to these grassroots organizations, it's like, oh my God, I didn't know that <laughs> so many people are still uh, uh, had these problems in education or in, 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 in food or whatever. So for me to, to, to show more about the women in philanthropy, giving circles could be a, a good way to, to, to include more women in, in different ways to giving. And also, as uh, Mosun and, and Lisa said, also like uh, I think the the the, the benefit to include uh, women, the, the, this this benefit will is globally, no? To include women and girls in 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 this area is very globally because uh, the, the community and the world will be much better. I think uh, you, we will be benefit uh, everyone because we see, as I said before, when. When a woman works, we have this systematic approach. So working in, in this area, I think will give a lot of uh, impactful uh, reactions and um, improvements in the sector. Thank you. Thanks for that insight, um, specific, specifically around collective action. Um, really appreciate that. And uh, I'm sure a lot of our audience also gained from what you shared around the perception of collective action, just not in Latin America, but really all over the world. Um, I'd like to move into kind of the, the next topic, which we'll, we'll wrap up the session and then open it up for, for questions. So very briefly, if each of our panelists can just um, kind of describe, uh, you know, their experience around this notion of, of systemic change, right? In other words, we're not simply addressing the symptoms, but what we are doing is we, we need to tackle the root causes of inequality and other um, problems that strain our societies today, right? And we found um, actually in, in a recent uh, report that was authored by Ashoka in partnership with McKinsey um, called Influencing for Good, it focuses really on highly resourced individuals. And the report argues that those with access to large resources can be particularly powerful in really enacting systemic change. And we saw from a lot of our research, including interviews with highly resourced individuals, that there's really a strong desire for these highly resourced individuals to do justice using four types of capital. Their political, their social, their economic, and their financial capital to deploy resources for the benefit of all. Again, addressing systemic change, the root causes of the problems and not just the problem itself. Would love to hear your experience and insight on this as a philanthropist. Um, Lisa, thank you. It feels so funny to always be going first here, but okay. Uh, so, yeah, I think that um, I. I, I Yes, there's all the different ways of making systemic change, but I, I just keep thinking as you were saying this, that money talks, you know, it's sort of um, that that seems to be what it's really going to take, uh, at least just to pave the way. And then, which is why I think these these women at Dartmouth, this was so um, impactful for me and so interesting is that they, they I am certain that there were people around them that said, there's no way you're going to be able to do this. You're not going to get 100 people to do give a million dollars each. It's just not going to happen. And um, I, I kind of feel like as women, that is that those are like fighting words that get us going and uh, like, OK, fine, watch us do that. And I think that's the place where we're at right now. Uh, I see that all over in all different, not just in philanthropy uh, in all over the uh, any kind of sector you want to look at with women. I mean, you look at athletes and just, you know, finally, the um, uh, the women's soccer players. I don't know if you all saw that, that they're now getting uh, equal pay, which is like, really? Like, that's awesome. I, I just didn't think, you know, who was going to make that happen first? That was fantastic. So, um, so, but I, I do think that it requires, um, uh, I, I think that, well, there's different ways to make it happen, but I think the fastest way to make it happen is for people with these 
large numbers of resources, or you call, as you call them, highly resourced individuals um, or groups, uh, to basically say, you know, we're going to make that change. We're going to be the first ones to go, not because we want to be first, just because somebody has to break the ice. And we're going to break that. We're going to get that going. And then kind of watch it grow from there. And I think it's been just absolutely wonderful. So I hope more people are going along those ways, that direction. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. And, and your thoughts, Masoon, on how to enact systemic change? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's really tied to our previous contribution, which is around collaboration. Um, I think it's important for us to collaborate if we're going to have systems change or um, have or address the systemic problems that we've always grappled with. Billions of, of dollars have come onto the continent to resolve issues and we've been treating symptoms for, for so many years. And so if we're, if we're going to have change, if we're going to address the root causes, it's going to be everyone coming together and everyone recognizing that we all have important roles to play in, in this journey. Um, so we need the philanthropists, we need the academics, we, we need the media, we need the NGO practitioners, we need everyone to come on board. But of course, this would not happen if someone isn't funding it. Um, and that is where philanthropy plays an important role. And that's why it's important to take risk. It's important to make big bets. Um, we cannot shift systems without big bets. So that's something that has got to happen especially on the African continent. And again, that is where African philanthropy is um, moving forward because we are, you know, again, APF is really about promoting local and homegrown philanthropy. It's, it's, it's important that we as, as Africans really do step up um, and we're open to collaboration with, interna with the international community, but nobody understands the issues we're facing as Africans do, you know, so you can only support the process um, with a long-term view if you're invested in it. Um, and so that's that's how it's important. And that's why, of, and this involves everyone really, it's not just women, all hands have to be on deck, but of course women have an important role to play um, to, you know, maybe break the ice as, as Lisa said. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's no, there's no silver lining, right? It's, it's really a global issue that requires a global response from, from women, of course, as leaders, and then um, men supporting, you know, that path for, for women as well. So I, I think they refer to as he for she's, right? So definitely um, a global issue that requires a global response. So thank you. Um, and Rosa, your thoughts on, on that particular question, and then we'll open up the floor. It looks like some questions from the audience are coming in, so we'd love to be able to address those. Yes, like for me also it's very important to, um, we are in, a, in, in, in the philanthropy sector, but also to, to, um, to look for this, uh, solving these problems, the roots that we have in, in, in different problems. I think we need to work more multi-sectorial multi approaches uh, pu public and private. I think the coalitions, the philanthropy right now is more, uh, the people know more about what is happening with philanthropy, as we say, because COVID and many things that are happening that we are more on the floor. So I think we have a, a moment to, to bring this impulse. We need that, we, we know that philanthropy, we can be risk takers, that we are not enterprises, that we are not uh, governance and everything. So how to impulse more? These multi-sectorial uh, approaches, coalitions, and public and private sector working together, and to be the ones like uh, impulsing these uh, things. Because if not, uh, although we know that uh, it's improving and everything, all the time the enterprises has the approach, this, uh, the 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 government, the public sector has the approach. So as as we know more what is happening in, in the different causes sectors, we know the contents, we have terrain, we are more bottom up on the things that we said. Perhaps how to impulse in and, and this I don't know if the, if the word in English is advocacy, but yeah, to bring our knowledge and all the, the things that we do every day to the other sectors. So they go more. <laughs> To, to, to the terrain, no? sometimes it's like they are still thinking how to, to look for solutions and we have the solutions, but they don't know how to do it. So we're more in, yeah, sectorial and articulating. 
to, to, to give this uh, systematic approach that we want to do to, to, to solve uh, different problems. And... Great, thank you. Thanks for that insight, um, Rosa. I think, you know, through our conversations, it's clear that we really need uh, a, a kind of detailed bottom-up approach to solving the issue. Um, also, there was some mention of not reinventing the wheel. I thought, I think Masu mentioned that as well which is well taken because, you know, solutions exist out there. So how can we collaborate? How can we ensure trust-based relationships? How can we look to others that, you know, have proximity to the issue? Um, the challenges are, are more than, you know, are solvable really, but collaboration helps them, um, you know, be more manageable to some degree. These are big, big challenges that the world faces. And certainly we need the talent, the time, the expertise, the resources of women, leaders and alike to help address those issues. With that, I'd like to just, we probably have a few more minutes just for questions. And um, I'd like to try to address them as they come in here. Um, there's a question specifically from the audience on what panelists recommend for young women looking to start philanthropic activities. So I'd open that up to our panelists um, to, to contribute uh, to that question in any way they seem fit. I didn't understand the question. Can you repeat it, please? Sure. I am sorry. I <laughs> went through it very fast. So what do our panelists recommend for young women looking to start philanthropic activities? Ah, OK. I OK, Lisa, go ahead. OK, no, first, well, thank, thank you. I just think jump right in. I think, you know, ju jump in the pool, just get going and do it. Uh, I don't think, I think um, fear doesn't need to be a piece of it. I think it's just get, get involved, do it, give somebody, you know, see how it works and talk to some people out there. And But I don't even think it's, um, I, I think that the, the gratification that you get from giving is will spur you on to, to give more. And you just have to not, and, and to realize that it's not a perfect world and it's evolving, but that I, I think that women need to be a part of it and they should bring their friends. Yes. Yeah, thanks. So I, I also think, oh, I'm sorry, you, Rosa, you want to no, say Okay, Marcy, no, no, it's okay. I, I, I finished. <laughs> go, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add that, you know, great. You probably are already doing philanthropy and you don't know it, um, you know, right. so. Yeah, um, I, and I think in addition to what Lisa has said, join a network. It always helps. A, a network will really boost your confidence. Um, you would not make mistakes that others made. You learn so fast um, and you, you'll be connected to a lot of resources you probably wouldn't have had access to if you were going this on your own. So all the best, just do it. And also, I think it will be important to go to some, I don't know where are you based, in which country and everything, but it's important to know grassroots organizations. Perhaps the typical organizations, they are the ones that you know, you go to the web page, they are very transparent, you can go to these nonprofits. But when you go to grassroots organizations, I think you are going to learn a lot what is happening and what they are doing. And it's going to be like a, a good practice and learning to, to see, oh my God, these are the challenges, the problems, Perhaps is that the causes. Uh, it's interesting to go to more to this kind of organizations because they are lack of normally of of, um, of money, and also they know a lot about the terrain, no, about the contents. So it will be great for you to, to like a very very fast learning. It will be nice for you for sure. And and I just want to add that if if you go to one of these places and it's not comfortable, it doesn't feel right. Don't assume that everybody operates the same way. They're all, every organization is different. And if something doesn't feel right for you, either what they're doing or how they're doing it or who's there, just move to another one. Don't give up. Just Amazing. find the one where it's comfortable. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for, for answers to that, the, uh, that specific question. There's another thought that uh, came in. Uh, you know, many of us uh, through this panel have both cited Melinda French Gates, as well as McKinsey Scott, at least here in the United States, um, about their philanthropic giving and how that is changing the landscape. The question um, and that we would kind of use to, to wrap up the panel and would love to have everyone's insight, all the panelists' insight on this specific question is, what can we 
um, as philanthropists, as entrepreneurs, as women leaders, as um, individuals in the social impact space, what can we do to further support the already existing um, legacy that's being built and left? So how can, how can we support what's going on currently? Um, and so Lisa, I would love to hear from you about that. Yeah, I, yeah, I think once again, it's just join in. Uh, I think it's really important to, um, to, you know, to really encourage not that not that not that those those women you just mentioned need encouragement but uh, but but I, I think to really make statements that 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 this is something we want to be part of and yes you are paving the way but we've got to jo join in there and we've got to all uh, uh, you know kind of do our thing with it and bring what what all the you know myriad different things that 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 women have of all different ages all different backgrounds uh, and I think that's really important and if we sit there and say oh, well, they've already given all this money. We don't have to do it now. I, I don't think that's going to help the systems at all. Uh, I think it needs to, this has to be a long-term uh, long viewpoint. And the best way to do it is to have as many women, uh, and, and as Mosun said, you know, we all give something at, at this point you know, anyway, but to see them and not to get worried, be worried about this term philanthropist, just you're going to support other women. You want to support the world. You want to support good causes. And so just start. For me, it's about empathy. Sometimes we are in in our war, in our in our family, in our problems, and uh, when you you look a little bit to the next, you don't have to go also to low income areas. Perhaps your neighbor, <laughs> perhaps a teacher. Sometimes we just to be more empathetic. Uh, you give gives you like a, a, another wave, and you start doing the things in another in another um, yeah with another. Um, I don't know the, English, the, the, the name right now, but with another wave, no, with another flavor. So I think we, we're speaking a lot about ah, oh, the empathy. My, my organization, when I created empathy, was not any any focus group, from any any agency. I said, what I miss in the world, empathy. I mean, empathy is just to be more empathy. So to, to have your 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 head with that um, name. But it's not because it's in fashion. I have to be empathetic and empathy here and this empathy there. It's just to be empathic. When you are like that, many things happen afterwards. <laughs> More soon because I, I, I went first. <laughs> right. Oh, right. I, I, I have nothing to add. I think you, I miss, you've spoken well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, everyone. And, you know, so many, so many great topics or great points have been addressed through this panel. You know, for me, it's how do we really take all of this information and how do we see beyond the money? Um, and, you know, so often philanthropic initiatives really focus, you know, solely on donors' financial resources, um, which is one aspect of it. But more important, almost more importantly, or at least as important is, you know, any one individual's impact will be far greater if they engage not just in the financial aspect, but also um, with other types of resources. Again, you know, we, we have explored um, in the report that I mentioned earlier, kind of the social, the political, the intellectual capital, in addition to the financial capital as well. And I think this has a lot of strength for women leaders. Uh, many of our panelists today, I'm sure the audience have, have, has noted, they are not just philanthropists or entrepreneurs, um, but they're also very active in their community. They're on boards. They are not standing on the sidelines. They are, you know, contributing to to um, initiatives in their in their very local communities. So that uh, political and that social as well as intellectual capital is also very very critical. Um, in closing, I I would like to just present the slides again that I presented in the introduction. Um, Lisa, if you want to just say a thing or two about the Learn About Lisa area um, so that our viewers can have more information about where to, to connect with you, that would be great. Sure. Uh, yeah, you can just go to lisagreer.com. It's pretty easy. Uh, and from there, you can subscribe to my uh, newsletter that comes out about every two weeks, and it's free. And uh, connect uh, in other, any other, other way, all the usual social media. 
Uh, and you can also find out about how to purchase my book, which is also available on Audible. So uh, very easy to access. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Masoon's information as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Learn about Africa Philanthropy Forum at our website, um, africanpf.org, and uh, social media, all our social media platforms are the same, um, APF.org. And I would also encourage you to, you know, just follow us closely in the within the next week because we're launching a platform to connect philanthropists and local organizations, and it will be a great place to, to visit and learn and share with members of your network. Thank you. Thank you. And Rosa? I'm Rosa, yeah, I'm in Chile, although I'm from Spain. I'm, yeah, very happy with my empathy, this organization. And you can see I'm very active in LinkedIn. Uh, you can go to my webpage. Um, and yeah, working a lot um, with uh, bringing more tendencies to Latin America, working with families, with corporations to show people that when you do good philanthropy and you, you, you do uh, this good approaches, as I told you, in, in, in the nonprofit sector, it's not so developed. So all the time, bringing tendencies to, to impact much better and, and more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Rosa. And with that, uh, our closing slide, you know, none of us can do this alone. It takes a village. So, you know, Ashoka has done some just amazing work in this in this sector. And the team that I lead here at Ashoka is around, you know, really building this, what we're calling the entrepreneur to entrepreneur network of big patent changing business entrepreneurs, um, standing with and working with uh, social entrepreneurs to really enact that everyone a change maker model. And it doesn't take one person. It doesn't take two. It takes, uh, you know, a whole team. And so very grateful for the team of support that we have here at Ashoka to bring that vision to life. Um, and so uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Priyanka, if you can just show the audience who our team is while we wrap up, that would be great. Well, I, I think the slides are off, but that's fine. But thank you to our audience dialing in from everywhere in the world. Thank you for your time today. To our esteemed panelists, thank you for sharing your vision, for sharing your time and your talent with us today and make it a great rest of the day. Thank you. You too. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.